I'm here tonight to tell you uh, what's going to be happening on October 2nd. But in order for me to tell you what's happening on October 2nd and how we're doing so far, I wanted to just take us back to where we started, then what our position is and what, what position we took in the case, what their response was, and that our, where, where our apply is. And then I'll tell you how we stand for uh, October 2nd. But as an overview, I'm very optimistic about where we are. I really am. So let's first take us back to where we were. So during the review process, the museum took the position that pursuant to an 1876 statute, they had the right to occupy the entirety of Theodore Roosevelt Park, corner to corner, sidewalk to sidewalk, and they could fill every square inch of it with buildings because according to them, an 1876 statute gave them that right. We said that's not right. We sued and we said that it can't possibly be the case that the statute gave them full run of the entire park. And we just offered several examples of why they were wrong. First, we pointed out that there were at least four occasions where the museum did not get pieces of the park, that instead it was given to other entities. In 1937, the Hayden Planetarium took over a section of the park. The Hayden Planetarium Authority is separate and apart from the museum, despite what some of you may think. It's a separate entity, and yet it was given to this entity, and the museum didn't say, wait a minute, that's ours. It was given to the Hayden Planetarium. There's a Theodore Roosevelt Memorial, which is also not part of the museum, not owned by the museum, not administered by the museum, and yet it was given a part of the park without the museum's permission or consent. In addition, there's the New York Times Times capsule. There's the dog run. There are many instances in which the, the park has been given to entities that are unrelated to or not owned by the museum. How is it that in 1876 they got the entirety of Theodore Roosevelt Park corner to corner, sidewalk to sidewalk, when at least on four occasions the, they, the museum did not get certain portions of the park and that other entities got portions of the park? That says to me very clearly that in 1876 they did not get all of the park. What did they get? Well, the statute said they had the right to enter into a contract with the, the city of New York, and that contract would allow the museum to occupy a portion of the park. And when, in 1877, the city of New York did enter into a lease with the museum, it entitled the museum to build one building. One building, not every, not throughout the entirety of the park, but in one portion of the park. And that explains why afterwards, when the museum wanted to expand, they actually had to go back to the state legislature and ask for permission to get additional land in the park. If they had gotten everything in 1876, they wouldn't have had to go back. So that's why I know that the statute never gave them that permission. And so that's the principal argument we made, that it was not, the statute did not give them the permission they said it gave them, and therefore they were required on this occasion to do what they did on all those other occasions. Either get permission from the state legislature again, or pursue what's called the Euler process, by which the city of New York doles out land pursuant to a very carefully regulated process by which the city obtains community consents and supports for any land disposition that the city is responsible for. So if the city has control of the park, the city must go through the Euler process, solicit your, your advice, solicit your input, go through an eight to 10 month process before anything can be given to the museum. That's what they should have done. They completely ignored it. They said, no, we're right about the statute. We also made environmental arguments. I'll talk about those at the end, but I want to focus for the moment about the statute. So remember what I said, 1876 statute, corner to corner, sidewalk to sidewalk, they need no more consents. Now, we filed that claim. In response to that claim, the museum said, did we say statute? We meant the lease. I'm not kidding. They changed their argument. They now are saying, that it wasn't the statute. Of course it's not the statute because the statute couldn't possibly support what they're saying. So now they're saying, actually we meant the lease. And if you look at the lease, it says in 17 places that they are entitled to one building. <laughs> However, in one place out of the 18, it says buildings. 
Now, it's a handwritten document because back then, you know, we, we, there weren't computers back in 1877. They hand wrote it. And it says in one instance buildings. In the other 17 places, it says one building. So, of course, the museum came to the logical conclusion that the 17 times it said singular building, that was the mistake. They really, that one time, buildings, that's really what was intended. Now, let's leave aside the fact that that's insane. And let's focus on the most important point I can tell you about with respect to one of our legal arguments. In New York, when an agency renders a decision based upon a particular rationale and they get sued, they cannot during the litigation say, well, it was something else. You can't do that. And that's exactly what they did. A city of New York cannot change its perspective, cannot change its reasoning based upon what happens in a lawsuit. And as evidence of the fact that they did that, number one, of course, it's obvious they've changed their position. They're now relying on the lease. And because they're now relying on a completely different legal theory, they have tried to add to the record volumes of documents and affidavits to try to explain why it really was the lease. Now, another rule in New York is that in addition to not being allowed to change your legal theory, you're also not allowed to add to the record. Now, if you think about it, those two concepts go hand in hand. You can't change your reasoning and you can't change the evidence. Because if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? If it were the case that you could change the reasoning after the fact, after you get caught, well, then the whole review process is a sham. So at a minimum, everything has to stop and they have to start all over again. That's number one. Number two, because we are right that the lease really said building and not buildings, because the 17 times it said singular was the correct way, and one time was what we call in the law Scrivener's error, meaning that someone was writing quickly and they wrote buildings instead of building. Because of that, okay, they are, what it means is that the city of New York has not yet given any additional land to the museum other than what the legislature has on previous occasions granted. So that means that if the city wants to give out any more land to the museum, they must comply with ULERP. Now, I mentioned that earlier. That's the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure. What does that mean? Like, why do we have ULERP? So ULERP is a very important si statute in the city of New York. Most of you probably haven't heard it. It's like a sound that a baby makes after you give too much food quickly. But ULERP is actually a very important statute. Uh, ULERP was designed to prevent the city of New York from giving out land without regard to fairness and most importantly to prevent corruption. If the city of New York could, could dispose of land to friends, to people who give money, to lobbyists, clients, to people who do favors for the mayor, I'm not suggesting anything. <laughs> um, if the city were able to do something like that, just give out land, your land, remember, Teddy Roosevelt Park is your land. If they could do that without actual any review, what would that mean? That would mean that the city of New York could give away your land without oversight. That's not permissible, and that's precisely why ULERP exists. So that when they do want to give out land, they have to be sure that the process completely is transparent, that everyone has the opportunity to participate and comment, that it's regimented, that they can't have meetings in 90 degree weather in the middle of the summer with no air conditioning on. For those of you who remember what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the meeting, I think, at the museum where they shut the air conditioning off and try to steam us out, but we all stayed, okay? They have to go through a very regimented process to ensure that whatever they dole out is done for a good reason from a public policy perspective and to ensure there's no corruption whatsoever. That didn't happen here, again, they gave away the land, or they tried to give away the land, without the Euler process at all. And so, because they failed to do that, that is another reason for that, this decision to be completely reversed. So, in addition to the reasons I just gave you, there's also a question about the environment. Now, well, <laughs> the environment, but by the way, before I forget, I, all those things I just told you, that's what's in our reply papers. So, we said that they violated, that the statute, number one, they changed the reasoning behind what they did. Uh, well, first we said that they, this, it's not the statute because the statute doesn't, uh, is, does not show that they got the whole park. That's completely wrong. 
and we made clear that uh, what they really need to do is go through ULERP. In response, they said it's the lease, not the statute. We, we got that wrong, and now we've shown that the lease doesn't do it either, and so now we're going to go to argument on that. In addition, on the environmental piece, on the environmental piece, our point is very simple. They did not do what's called a hard look. They did not give a hard look to the potential environmental hazards that this project portends. So what am I talking about in that regard? Uh, for those of you who've heard me talk about this before, one of the things they found in the ground, our independent consultants, GHD consultants, who by the way, uh, they are an environmental consulting firm in 130 countries on six continents across the world, but they do no business in New York, so they don't owe the developers any favors. I know that's crazy, right? They're in 130 countries, but they're not in New York City. Thank God, because they weren't conflicted out. So they did their own report. We didn't write it. It's not like what the museum and the city did. We have an independent consultant. What they found is trichloroethylene in the ground. TCE is the same substance they found in the ground in Latham, Massachusetts. If you've ever seen the movie A Civil Action or read the book, you'll know that that's the substance that was found in the ground that was killing people. Okay? There is TCE in the ground, in the park. It's deep. But if they want to build their building and they do the excavation, that stuff is coming up. In addition, there are underground storage tanks in the ground. Underground storage tanks ordinarily have substances that were so hazardous to health that back in the 40s and the 50s, they buried them in the ground. The problem is, back in the 40s and the 50s, they did not anticipate that the, 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 the encasement of the substances would eventually deteriorate. And so as a consequence, any shuffling of the ground could potentially rupture these tanks, which they have not adequately considered. There are other substances in the ground as well that could be disturbed. And if they are disturbed, the museum, the people who live in the museum, they're not sleeping in the park. They're not living on Columbus Avenue or 77th or 78th Streets. They're going to Great Neck and they're going to White Plains, wherever they live. They get to leave. You guys have to live with it. And they don't seem to care. So there's a real concern about ambient air quality. There's a real concern about the hazardous substances in the, in the environment. In addition, there are major transportation issues here. Okay? They have said that they are going to increase the population of those attending the museum by approximately one million people a year going in through the western entrance. And they say that based entirely upon a square footage analysis, meaning that Historically, if you increase the size of an institution like the, Metro, the, the American Museum of Natural History, that for every square foot of increase, there's a certain number of additional people who come. And the problem with that analysis is, in the very same environmental assessment, they also said that they are going to provide massive improvements to the museum, particularly on the west side of the museum. It seems to me that a square footage analysis is not adequate under circumstances in which they are making what they describe as major improvements. Because the greater the improvements, the more attractive the museum is to other people who want to come. And sometimes people will come more than once. And sometimes uh, schools will pull up with buses and, 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 and long lines of kids. The long and the short of it is one million people a year is not an adequate or accurate projection. They should have done a much more careful projection. We expect it's going to be closer to 1.5 million people a year. And when we talk about buses, they say, don't worry, there's not going to be a problem with it. There's going to be a designated area for the buses. They won't be idling. I can just tell you, in my experience, in dealing with the Metropolitan Museum of Art, what happens is the buses, they pull up and they stop. They empty their loads. Sometimes the bus drivers just sit there and wait. And if they do that, by the way, as you all know, there's a bike lane and a parking lane now on the immediate west side of the museum between the, uh, between the park and the other side of Columbus Avenue. So what's going to happen is you're really going to be restricted to two lanes of traffic, whereas previously, in years past, there were four. And so when that bus, by the way, pulls out, if there's another bus in front of it, it's going to have to swing across two lanes of traffic. The long and the short of it is that there are going to be significant transportation impacts. In addition to that, there's a, a tremendous amount of congestion that's going to surround the museum. There are going to be lots of cars with drop-offs and, and then pull-aways. And so as a consequence, there's going to create an additional amount of vehicular traffic in close proximity to not only the, the, the park, but there's a school right there. There are children who are going to be frequenting the museum. And at the same time, there's going to be all this increased congestion around the museum. And they have not adequately provided for it. I mean, they can tell we're going to get it done in 24 months. 
But we all know what construction is like in the city of New York. It's not going to be 24 months. It's going to be three to five years. And that means the park is not going to be available to anybody except, you know, the museum, which as far as they're concerned is okay because they claim they own the park corner to corner and sidewalk to sidewalk. So when we wrote our reply papers, we opened up with the following point. In addition to the environmental issues which I just talked about, we tell the court flat out, the outcome of this case is going to determine whether Theodore Roosevelt Park continues to be a public park available to the people of the city of New York. That's what's on the hook. That's what's at stake here. And so I commend all of you for fighting to protect your environment, to fighting to protect your park. Because the truth is, in the city of New York, although we have the grandeur of Central Park and Prospect Park and our pocket parks, the truth is every piece of green space in New York City is precious and important. And I, I would say to you, for, for, as someone who's done a, a fair amount of traveling throughout the, the United States, I like to take RV trips, I love to drive around New, the United States, I encourage all of you to do it, by the way. You, if, if you haven't done it, if you haven't traveled around the cities of the United States, I encourage you to do it because what you find, and what I have found, is that there is no place and I mean no place that is anything like the city of New York. And it is in large part because not only did we fight to build our, our, our metropolis here, but we fought to preserve our parks. We fought to preserve our green space. We fought to preserve areas where families can, can enjoy their time on weekends and in evenings so that we can really enjoy what we have here. And that's really, if you look, go around this, the United States, you're not going to see anything like what we have here. And so that's why this fight is so important. Because right now it's Theodore Roosevelt Park. In 2004, it was Central Park when Metropolitan Museum of Art wanted to expand into Central Park. It's going to be, and that's going to be the next one. And then after that, it's going to be Prospect Park. Brooklyn Bridge Park right now, they have condominiums in a park in the city of New York. I'm not kidding. In Brooklyn Bridge Park, there are two condominium buildings and a hotel. Yes, I am telling you, there's a lot more. Don't get me wrong. Theodore Roosevelt Park is a very important park to the west side, and I love it. But this is just one of many battles that the, city of, that the people of the city of New York must fight. Because if we lose our parks, we really lose our identity. After all, as I said, it's so much a part of who we are. So, like I said, I commend you guys for fighting to preserve Teddy Roosevelt Park and to fight to preserve green space here. And as far as October 2nd is concerned, we show up and we make the argument. A lot of what I said to you tonight is what I'm going to say on October 2nd. I held back quite a bit. So if you're passing this along on the public, uh, uh, to the public and the other side is watching, I left out a lot of good stuff. But I will tell you that as far as I am concerned, having reviewed the law, I really feel that we're right here. I just do. And I've been struggling in my head. Should I invite all of you to come to the, to the event? Should I invite everyone to show up in the courtroom? It's a tough call. Not because I don't want to see you all. I love to see you guys. But the problem is the courtroom is very small. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to notify uh, Laura and Bill and Claudia and Claude and let them know about whether or not there's a way for us to accommodate everyone by maybe getting the case put in a different courtroom. But if we do that, if we do that, everyone's got to show up. I can't tell the judge, get me a big room because a lot of people are coming and then six people show up and then four of them leave. If we do this, if I tell the court we need to have a bigger room, I need to make sure that everyone is going to show. When I say everyone, I don't mean 6,000 people, although that's OK. Just let me know. But if people are going to show up at this, I just need to know in advance. So that's one thing I'm going to work on with, with, with your, your leadership team, which is doing a great job for you, by the way. Uh, and then you know, either you'll show up. Oh, yeah, give them a hand. They do great. I have to tell you, and, and, and they're not paying me to say this, it's honest to God. I work with leadership teams on opposition work all over the city, and you guys are really very fortunate because they really work hard and they really care. And it's not to say that other groups don't have that also, but these guys really put in the time and they really focus. So I do appreciate their work. So th I, I will thank you on behalf of my firm. So thank you guys for doing the great work that you do. Anyway, so keep an eye out for their emails.
keep an eye out for their communications. And like I said, if you want to be there on October 2nd, please let them know, and I'll do what I can to make the arrangements.